So hello everyone, now switching to English. Uh, thanks to all the non-Greek uh, speakers who pay patiently waited. And uh, my name is Georges Valagianis. And uh, in this presentation, I'd like to uh, tell you a few things about my PhD thesis, which was titled, uh, as you can see, Testing Gravity with Cosmology, Efficient Simulations, Novel Statistics and Analytical Approaches, and was performed under uh, the supervision of uh, Professor Rachel Bean, while I was at Cornell. So uh, despite the fact that I'm now at Harvard, uh, I'm gonna be mostly talking about work that I did while I was at Cornell. So let's start with a brief introduction to the main motivation behind uh, my PhD thesis, but also behind uh, most of what I do these days, which is nothing else than the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, so it's been more than 20 years now, uh, ever since the initial discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. And uh, as a in cosmology, uh, we can now proudly claim that uh, we have a standard model of cosmology. Based on this widely accepted cosmological scenario uh, that we call Lambda CDM, uh, the universe uh, uh, is uh, very consistent with, with an intellectual picture in which, uh, the, uh, in which general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, is the correct theory of gravity, and uh, in which the universe uh, is described by a non-zero value of the cosmological constant, which we all know plays the role of vacuum energy becomes dominant at late times and causes the expansion to accelerate. And uh, also, of course, there is, uh, uh, we believe that uh, uh, there's also a second uh, dark energy component to the universe, which is something that behaves like a, a cold pressure form of matter, the cold dark matter, that I'm not going to talk about uh, that much today. Uh, now, uh, this lambda CDM picture has been very successful at capturing a wide range of observations uh, over, over, uh, over these two decades. Uh, and of course, one could even additionally uh, uh, consider a more generally uh, dynamically involving dark energy component, uh, but it, this is actually not even necessary to explain observations. Uh, now, despite all these successes, there is no shortage of theoretical alternatives uh, to this lambda CDM model of the universe. And this is mainly motivated by what we call the cosmological constant problem, uh, uh, which is essentially a, a statement which says that uh, the necessary best fit value of this cosmological constant uh, in order to explain all observations is much, much lower than uh, the one uh, that one would naively expect. And also, of course, by the need to explore all other possibilities, because theorists like myself would always try to study all, uh, a variety of different scenarios. So one of these alternative proposals uh, state that uh, essentially looks into the left-hand side of the Einstein, uh, Einstein's equation of general relativity, what you can see here, and uh, wonders states that uh, what we observe, oops, uh, yes, uh, what we observe might be the signal of a fundamental deviation from Einstein's gravity, which could be responsible for driving the expansion of the universe to accelerate instead of dark energy. These types of theories go under the name of modified gravity, which is essentially an umbrella term. It encompasses all potentially interesting and viable ways in which one can perform this task uh, in the context of cosmology. However, easier said than done, because we know that Einstein's gravity is a, uh, together with its Newtonian counterpart, is a very successful theory, especially in the vicinity of our solar system, where we can directly observe its effects in detail, in detail, but also across multiple many other astrophysical systems, and of course, gravitational waves, which is the latest observation and about which you're going to hear a lot in this conference. So in order to be able to satisfy all of these different constraints, but also at the same time uh, uh, remain cosmologically viable and explain cosmic acceleration, viable candidates that I'm going to consider in this presentation uh, invoke what we call a screening mechanism, which is a dynamical mechanism that suppresses deviations locally within the environments of high density, like on Earth, and only allows them to become significant in the very low density regions of the universe, essentially the, the cosmic voids. And this is what this picture here on the right is meant to communicate. Uh, 
Well, what this actually means in practice is that it, it would be only in the uh, low density environments of the very, very large scales of the universe that this degeneracy between the standard cosmological prediction of lambda CDM and these alternative models would be broken which essentially implies that we would need to perform cosmological observations in order to test such a hypothesis. Uh, me again. Uh -huh. And uh, this of course makes sense because we know that uh, the large scale structure of the universe, uh, which consists mainly of, of galaxies, carries a wealth of information about the underlying fundamental physics because essentially it has emerged as the, as the outcome of the nonlinear processing of the primordial density field. And indeed, if I was asked to uh, summarize uh, the, uh, the scope uh, of modern physical cosmology, maybe I would, I would present a slide like this, where here on the left, uh, one can start with a given set of physical assumptions and physical laws, and this list is not exhaustive, so pick your favorite theory. Uh, and then use those to make a prediction about how the universe would look like under uh, this given set of assumptions. A prediction that then uh, will need to be compared against actual observations so that we can test or uh, exclude uh, such a hypothesis. And of course, this feedback loop between theory and observation uh, allows us to refine our understanding of the universe. And uh, what I actually like about this plot here is that uh, it is only the upper half that uh, represents actual observations of, of the distribution of galaxies in the universe. The lower half, the red half, I mean, uh, is actually an outcome of a simulation. And uh, uh, if you couldn't tell the difference between those two, it means that we are actually doing a good job but uh, 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 they're actually distinct. There are two samples that are meant to have the same statistical properties, but they're not identical. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, back to our hypothesis, if it is true that uh, cosmic acceleration provides a hint for a breakdown of the laws of gravity at very large scales, we would need that it modified gravity, we would need or we have to be able to make a prediction about what that would imply for the observable universe so that we can then uh, test such a scenario. And uh, what this means is, and this is actually timely because the field of cosmology finds itself in a great time in which uh, a wide variety of uh, large scale uh, um, uh, international uh, collaborations are going to observe the universe with great detail in, in this decade and further, as you will see shortly. So what this actually, uh, what all of this means is that uh, we need to be able to make a prediction uh, about how the universe would look like. And this is something that we can fortunately do uh, uh, thanks to, this to, to, to two basic facts. One, thanks to the fact that uh, we have a very good understanding about how the initial distribution of the universe, of the primordial universe, looked like, or the statistical properties of it, to be precise, uh, through very detailed and successful observations of, of course, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Here I'm showing a very nice picture by the Planck satellite. And also combine this with the fact that uh, we can perform simulations in order to study the numer numerically the gravitational, nonlinear gravitational evolution of this primordial state of the universe that has given rise uh, to what we observe today, including ourselves, of course. And we can do that. And we can do this, uh, for example, here I'm showing you uh, an outcome of such a simulation or in particular, the 2D projection of the density field of matter in the universe for a scenario that looks very close to what, we, what our universe looks like, a lambda CDM model uh, governed by Einstein's gravity. Uh, but also we can do this for these alternative scenarios. And here I'm showing you in the middle panel and in the lower, in, in the, uh, in the uh, right panel, how the universe, how the same region of the universe would look like uh, under two of these alternative gravity models. Uh, these are very popular in the literature. I'm not going to get into great details about their properties, uh, their phenomenological properties, but I'm very happy to talk about them further for anyone that is interested. Uh, now in practice, what matters for us is that we need to be able to look into this, study their properties and make a comparison 
so that we can actually see if 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 such a prediction is viable. And if you don't believe me, these distributions are different, as I have highlighted, for example, right here. So you can you can even visually spot some differences in the distribution of matter in the universe. Of course, of course, in cosmology, we can do a much better job of quantifying and studying the statistical and distribution properties uh, of um, of the universe, but this is just to guide the eye in case you didn't believe me. So what this actually means now, as you understand, is that uh, uh, in order to be able to fully utilize the wealth of all of these upcoming observations of the universe, as far as testing the laws of gravity and testing the nature of dark energy is concerned, we need to be able to make theoretical predictions for how the universe would look like in the variety of all these scenarios, efficiently and reliably. Now, this last step, meaning theoretically predicting how the universe looks like, uh, especially in the case of these uh, modified gravity models, turns out to be particularly challenging because of the fact that essentially we now have to deal with a new additional fifth force of nature. What I mean is that these modified gravity models, and in particular through this screening mechanism I, I, I mentioned, uh, turn out to, to have a very highly nonlinear behavior that increases the computational cost of conventional uh, predictive tools. So this is where my, my PhD thesis came in. In particular, in my PhD thesis, uh, I addressed several of these different challenges so that our theoretical predictions can successfully confront observations. And in the first part of the presentation, I'll talk about how we can speed up the existing simulations. Uh, for such models. Uh, then I will talk about how we can uh, account for, for this, the observable effects of uh, large scale galaxy bias and relative space distortions for, uh, this, for, for a given model. And you will see what these are about. And, and lastly, depends on how much time we have. I'm also gonna talk about the design of some novel statistics that we can fully, that we can utilize in order to make a, a more confident uh, uh, observations or detections and tests of gravity at large scales. So let's start with the first topic, that of the simulations that I have already basically introduced. And if, even if we forget about uh, deviations from Einstein for a moment, it seems that in generally, uh, when it comes to producing accurate realizations of how the universe would look like uh, or looks like uh, under a given set of assumptions, we always find ourselves stuck in between two different paradigms. On the one hand, uh, when we want to produce uh, when we want to produce accurate pictures of the universe down to small enough scales, we have to perform full uh, simulations, exactly because of the fact that the dynamics that govern its evolution are highly nonlinear, and these are very accurate and a lot of people have done an amazing job at them. But the problem is that they are very computationally expensive, so this is something that is not always feasible. On the other end. In, the, in a regime of structure formation that can be analytically tractable, we can get away with using uh, analytical approaches uh, such as perturbation theory, which is uh, our favorite tool as theorists. And perturbation theory is, is great. Many of you have used it in many different domains or astrophysics, I'm sure. But the problem is that it breaks down as we, as we reach smaller scales. And this is a problem because actually we need to fully utilize the smaller scales in order to uh, harness all the information that is available, uh, that is available to us. So we always get to choose between these two, but one might wonder whether we could somehow combine the strengths of both approaches into, into a new uh, middle ground, let's say, which is exactly what was performed by what was called the co-moving Lagrangian acceleration uh, scheme, which is an acronym COLA, which stands for it. So COLA is a hybrid scheme that essentially combines these two. It combines, it combines uh, an analytical component that involves the large scales of the universe using perturbation theory, in particular Lagrangian perturbation theory, as well as uh, with a pure end body component, a pure end body simulation that can give us the desired accuracy in the smaller scales. And the combined outcome of this scheme is, is a predictive uh, tool that uh, gives predictions that are much, much faster than conventional uh, full simulations, but more accurate, way more accurate than perturbation theory. 
And this deal sounds sounds like exactly what we need in the case of these modified gravity models. Uh, exactly because of the fact that uh, they are so that, that uh, they make simulations so challenging. This is exactly what we did together with my advisor Rachel B in our 2017 paper, uh, where we essentially expanded this method. Uh, and by taking into account, uh, uh, by taking the necessary phenomenology into account in order to support predictions for these beyond GR scenarios. And uh, the result turned out to work great. And if I show you here uh, a sample, an example of this, of this result, I, I told you previously that we can do a much better job at quantifying uh, the clustering properties of the universe. Uh, one such estimator is the two point correlation function which is uh, the excess probability uh, of finding a correlated pair of galaxies uh, compared to a random sample, as well as its Fourier transform, which is the power spectrum. So here I plot the, the fractional deviation of the power spectrum with regards to the common case of uh, lambda CDM of GR uh, for a variety of such modified gravity models. If we were talking about uh, lambda CDM, this would be zero, but as you can see, it is positive, it is non-zero, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <coughs> exactly because of the existence of uh, modified gravity. And where you can see that the predictions by our COLA scheme, which are shown here by the solid blue line everywhere, uh, are very consistent uh, with the predictions by a full end body simulation shown here by the red line for all the different cases we considered within uh, the error bars. And uh, the only difference is that the COLA prediction uh, came from a code that is two orders of magnitude, almost exactly 100 times faster than the full body simulation, thanks to this optimization of, by COLA, and also thanks to some additional approximations we perform. And this is all great, and it means that uh, this is a scheme that uh, can be is, is ideal for us to use in many cases where we need to perform millions of evaluations to study a model, such as, for example, the Markov chain Monte Carlo parameter inference. And one can construct emulators, but uh, I don't have time to talk about this uh, further. Let me now uh, move on to uh, the second part of the presentation. Uh, so you might have noticed that so far I've been talking about uh, dark matter and uh, the results I showed you previously and the power spectra I showed you above refer to the distribution of dark matter in the universe, which is a very nice initial stepping stone, but we are still not finished because we know that uh, when, when uh, uh, my observational friends look into the universe, uh, they observe galaxies uh, and structures that do not perfectly trace the underlying dark matter density field, even, even though they were formed inside of it. Uh, but they are, as we say, biased tracers of it. And uh, once again, if we want our theoretical predictions to successfully confront upcoming observations, this topic that we call large scale galaxy or halo bias needs to be incorporated in our predictive schemes. And this is what I'm going to uh, describe in this part of the presentation. But so now you notice that I added one layer of, non uh, of complexity, this of the bias, but I will remove also one and I will now focus my attention on, on uh, the range of scales uh, in, in which the problem of structure formation is analytically tractable, meaning I will use uh, our favorite perturbation theory. And uh, I'm sure many of you have talked about cosmological perturbation theory around an FRW background in your cosmology classes. Uh, so now in the, co in the particular context of, uh, of the bias, uh, once again, if I was asked to, to summarize uh, the process of predicting the universe by uh, using a diagram, I would pick this very nice one by Tobias Baldau, where uh, we essentially, our goal is to move from uh, the lower left corner to the upper right across the diagonal. And our goal is to both take, uh, take account uh, for uh, the nonlinear evolution of the dark matter density field, and also for the statistical relationship between the galaxies and the dark matter, which I just defined as the bias. And commonly, the conventional thought uh, in perturbation theory is to follow an Eulerian picture of dynamics that I'm sure many of you have, have used and have seen in your classes and in your research, in which we, we, we uh, focus on a given uh, region in, in time and, and we follow its evolution. But here, I will instead use the Lagrangian uh, picture of fluid dynamics uh, because it happens to work very, very well in cosmology. 
it has a long history and there's a reason for this that I'm gonna get into here. What I'd just like to say is to remind all of you that in the Lagrangian picture of dynamics, we follow the evolution of a fluid element. In our case, it could be a galaxy or a patch of matter as it moves uh, 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 through space. And so uh, uh, using this picture, uh, our goal is twofold. One is to find an analytical model to describe, uh, to assign uh, galaxies and halos to their initial positions. And then one needs to see how they will, would evolve uh, forward in time under the process of gravitational instability. Now, this second, uh, this second step has been recently worked out uh, also for a general, the, the general case of uh, a wide class of all of these uh, modified gravity models by many people, including me and my advisor in 2019. The equations get quite lengthy, but I'm not going to show any of them here, so don't worry. Uh, but for the other step, the statistical, the statistical relationship between galaxies and the underlying their mother density field, the bias, when we work in the Lagrangian space, as I said, we need to be very careful because some of the common assumptions we make in the context of standard gravity now do not hold anymore. And uh, in particular, in the common standard introductory cosmology picture that many of you might have seen, we uh, identify the positions where galaxies form roughly as the positions uh, in the initial density field where the local over density over, uh, uh, overcomes, exceeds a given threshold which is the critical density for gravitational collapse. And under the assumption of spherical symmetry, of spherical collapse, uh, and especially in the einstein de Sitter cosmology, this critical uh, density for spherical collapse uh, is uh, found to be a constant, uh, which is an assumption that works very well. However, this is not the case anymore uh, when we go beyond Einstein, because of the fact that uh, essentially, um, Birkhoff's theorem of general relativity is violated and the interior of the collapsing sphere now depends on the external space time. And what is actually the case is that this critical density for collapse, for spherical collapse, uh, is now a function of the mass of a collapsing galaxy and also of the environmental over density in which, uh, in which uh, uh, a galaxy or a halo will form. And you can see this result plotted here, but I'm not going to get into details. Uh, what I would just like to say is that uh, by, by accounting for this novel phenomenology, we created an analytical model for the prediction of these, of these bias factors uh, in a variety of gravity models that you can see plotted here as an example, that we also compared against full simulations and found to work very well phenomenologically. And this is all great. And what it actually means now is we, uh, we were ready to put the pieces together meaning we were uh, in, a, in a position to combine our model for this statistical relationship of the bias with the nonlinear gravitational evolution for the bias tracers and make a prediction about how, how the density field or how the distribution of the universe would look like. And, uh, uh, but and this, is, this is all great. And uh, speaking as a theorist, I could just stop there. But the problem is that of course, we need to, to make sure, we needed to make sure that our model worked well. Uh, and to do this, we need to make a prediction about some observable quantity, as I said previously, and compare it against simulations or observations. And here I show such a comparison against uh, full and body simulations for these two mod models of modified gravity that I mentioned previously, the F of R, and Sawiki model, and this NDGP model. Uh, these are state of the art, uh, uh, simulations that were performed for these models. And here I compare the theoretical prediction by our analytical uh, framework against these simulations for the two point correlation function. Previously, I showed you the Fourier space counterpart, the power spectrum. Now I'm showing you the two point correlation function uh, for a different, uh, uh, for varying uh, masses of different galaxies. And where you can see that our theoretical prediction which in its full uh, form is shown by the solid blue line, does a very good job at capturing uh, the simulated one, which is shown by the various uh, bullets and markers across a wide range of scales. And uh, let me also say that this prominent feature that you see here, this bump, because 
cosmologists will probably recognize it in the audience, is the, the so-called baryonic acoustic oscillation feature which is a very sensitive probe of fundamental physics. And it is great to see that our model uh, captures it very well. Uh, and there's reasons for this. It is thanks to the, uh, to, uh, the benefits of uh, this, of Lagrangian perturbation theory. And we repeated, we were able to confirm similar, similar levels of accuracy across a wide range of, of, of different such models. Uh, uh, but I don't want to get into further details here. And so this is all great. We found, bottom line, we found a model that made very good prediction, uh, predictions about the distribution of galaxies in modified gravity models. But if we want to make, if we want our models to confront observations that are made by a given specific type of uh, observation uh, that uses a spectra of galaxies that we call spectroscopic observations, we're still not done. And the reason for this is nothing else than the Doppler effect that all of you know, meaning that, uh, or to be more precise, uh, the peculiar, the, 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 the velocities of uh, galaxies in the large scale structure of the universe uh, around the Hubble flow that we call peculiar velocities introduce uh, and uh, introduce essentially a missing identification of the position of an identified uh, galaxy or tracer that in turn gives rise to an observed anisotropy in the clustering pattern of galaxies that we call the rest of space distortions uh, or RSD. And what this actually means is that uh, if one observes the universe that way, uh, it, 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 is, it is not found to be isotropic because of this effect. So this, this, what this actually means in practice or from a theorist standpoint is that this additional anisotropy also needs to be taken into account. And what this means in particular in practice, what it meant for me and for my advisor is that we needed to uh, incorporate, uh, to, we needed to uh, complement our model with an additional prescription about how to perform this mapping between the regular real space, as we call it, and the red space. And to do so, we picked a, a, a very successful prescription to do this, which is called the Gaussian streaming model that has been used in standard gravity for decades. And uh, without getting into much detail, this model makes a, a, an assumption about the probability, the, the velocity probability distribution. It assumes that it is Gaussian uh, in order to map a given correlated pair of uh, galaxies from the real to the rest of space. And the, ne the necessary ingredients to implement this model, in addition to the standard two-point correlation function that I've talked about before, uh, are also the first two non-vanishing velocity moments of the galaxy density field, the mean pairwise velocity of galaxies, uh, and its dispersion around the mean. And once again, we used uh, the same perturbation theory framework to model these velocity moments. The equations get even lengthier in the case of the velocities, so I'm not going to attempt to show any of them here. Uh, what I just like to uh, say is that, uh, well, once again, one needs to make sure that uh, uh, the velocities can be accurately captured by an analytical model, which is what we confirmed here, that you can see the same, the same comparison against, against the simulations on this plot here, across a wide range of different parameterizations and times. And the same for the pairwise velocity dispersion. Uh, and actually, it turns out that the dispersion is something that one needs to get accurately if one wants to capture small scales. So it is great to see that we could capture both. And what this actually meant is that once again, we could combine, combine all these three pieces to make a prediction uh, uh, about uh, uh, what we see in the universe. And now, because we talk about an anisotropy, as it is commonly done in the case of an anisotropic function, one can perform a multiple expansion to separate angular and spatial uh, uh, dependence and project out the different multiples started from the first order non-vanishing multiple, the monopole of the two-point correlation function of galaxies in rest of space now, where you can see how well our model is working against the simulations. And then moving on to the second, uh, but the monopole is actually quite easy. What is hard to get uh, analytically is the next order non-vanishing multiple, the quadruple, the L equals two uh, model the L equals two uh, moment 
that you can see compared here and where you can see besides some numerical noise that uh, our model does a very good job at capturing uh, the shape of this uh, uh, quadruple moment down to scales of almost 15 or 10 megaparsecs, which is great for an analytical model. And th this model, I'd like to just uh, conclude by saying that we put out in, in uh, the last paper that was part of my thesis with my advisor and a collaborator of ours, it, it represents the very first analytical model in the literature that simultaneously captured the effect of both a uh, large scale galaxy bias and redshift space distortions for a given model of modified gravity uh, up to third order. So I'm very happy about, about this and uh, it can be a very useful tool uh, uh, to the community. So lastly, uh, I, I would like to very quickly also talk about uh, a, a last element, a last topic that we addressed in, in my thesis before I conclude and before I run out of time. So, so far I've been talking about uh, different theoretical ways to make predictions about uh, the deviations from uh, the, the, the observed deviations uh, of Einstein, uh, from Einstein's gravity in the cosmic density field, in the large scale structure of the universe. What I have not said explicitly was how large these deviations are and how easy they are to produce. The answer is that because of this screening property, to remind you because of this mechanism that suppresses deviations in the high density environment, uh, and it's where essentially these models disguise themselves as general relativity, it makes uh, potential detection very challenging, even for, for the future ambitious surveys uh, of the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, however, given that we are aware of this distinct phenomenology, meaning given that we know where to hunt for such deviations, if we could somehow reverse on, the, uh, on this effect by emphasizing on the cosmic voids, essentially on the low density regions, we could hopefully reverse some of this suppression this is exactly the aim behind a series of different techniques, which essentially downweight uh, the high density regions and sometimes also upweight the low density ones with the aim of exactly uh, exposing uh, potential deviations from gravity that could be hidden in the cosmic density field. And there has been a variety of those in the literature, uh, uh, many of those that can be considered uh, to the fund uh, and the fundamental quantity of interest, of course, when we talk about structure formation, perturbation theory, is the fractional matter over, uh, of density, this delta quantity. And we consider different uh, transformations of it uh, uh, that have been proposed and also proposed a new one or considered a new one that is called the marked transformation. And to make a long story short, because I'm running out of time, we found that uh, by indeed applying these smart and simple tricks and one can design novel statistics that can allow us to more confidently differentiate between different models of gravity uh, when, we, when we look out into the universe. Because essentially we found that we can enhance the amount of information that we can get out uh, of the same distribution. And uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff we can uh, do with this. And this is a very active evolving field of science. But uh, lastly, uh, this my thesis and uh, my talk has been most on a theoretical, theoretical front, but in practice, when we want to look out into the universe, things are not as simple as many of you know that. Uh, so uh, we need to actually uh, uh, put way more greater efforts uh, uh, in order to scientifically uh, uh, utilize observations of uh, the large scale structure of the universe. Now, to that end, for the past year and a half, I've had the pleasure and the honor of leading, uh, of being a member of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. Uh, 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 and I have, I've had the honor of leading the small topical team that has been responsible, that is responsible for identifying and testing models of modified gravity or beyond WCDM, beyond dark energy, uh, with uh, the next uh, generation uh, instrument uh, of cosmology that we call the Vera Rubin Observatory LSST, a 10 year survey that will identify uh, billions or maybe more galaxies. And uh, you can see if, uh, we, we've gone with my team at great lengths uh, at identifying uh, at mapping out the variety of all these different models of this type that, is, that are available in the literature. Uh, because I only talked about two, but there's a whole uh, zoo of them. 
And uh, for those of you that are, that are interested in our plans to explore the general, the general class of such models, uh, you can uh, take a look at the node that we publicly put together. And also you can, you can take a look at a, an emulator we recently designed using my Cola code that I introduced previously. And lastly, uh, here you can see a picture of, of one of our meetings uh, from March 2019. I put it there not because we are photogenic, but mostly because I wanted to remind uh, myself and all of you of a time that we could actually meet in person. Hopefully this will happen again soon very soon in the future. And having said that, let me now conclude. Uh, uh, I, I, for those of you that are very, very interested in all of these topics and in follow-up works that I've been involved, I've here summarized a list of the relevant pub publications uh, for, and that you can check out. And uh, lastly, I would just like to say that uh, in, uh, we're entering an era, a decade that we call the golden era of precision cosmology. Because and we call it that way because a, a, a combination of very expensive billion-dollar uh, large-scale observational campaigns, including the LSST Rubin Observatory that I mentioned, the dark energy scientific instrument that has already started, W first, but also Euclid, uh, which is a, a European Union-funded uh, mission, will uh, uh, observe the universe in great detail and will uh, offer us an unprecedented opportunity to uh, infer the properties of dark energy, of gravity at large scales, but also of other uh, open topics in cosmology, such as the nature of inflation, uh, dark matter, of course, and massive neutrinos. So there's a lot of exciting, there's a lot of work, but a lot of exciting work ahead of us. And it has only now begun. So having said all of that, I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining uh, me here today. And of course, I would like to once again, uh, thank the organizers and the Karlafis fam family for this great honor. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Yorgo. Uh, very exciting talk. Uh, let's see if someone has uh, uh, a question, please raise your hand. I see Manolis Pleonis uh, has a question, Manoli. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, he's muted. No, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Vasilis. Uh, George, hi again, after a few years. Uh, really excellent talk, uh, mostly excellent work. Uh, I think it was very impressive. Uh, your, your whole career seems to be boosting and uh, we're very happy. Um, having you here, of course, and uh, representing the Greek uh, astronomical community in the in the world. Right now, let me let me ask you a few questions, um, and I'll try to uh, to be uh, as as uh, compact as possible. Uh, your, uh, of course, um, the whole the, the first part of your talk. I think it's very important to understand that it's one of the major issues in cosmology to try to get analytical predictions in order to avoid uh, using uh, the computational time that you need in, to uh, run large simulations. So having done that part, especially for this new uh, new uh, theoretical background, which is the, 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 the alternative to the dark energy, uh, the modified gravity, or not exactly modified gravity, alternative, let's say gravity. Uh, I think it, that's very interesting and for, for all of us that, uh, that work in cosmology. Uh, now, the question is the following. Uh, your you have compared your theoretical predictions with, um, with simulations. Okay, now, uh, that entails a variety of steps that, of course, you did not have time to uh, indulge into. However, uh, if I understood well, you used PM simulations, particle mesh simulations, which we know that they are not that accurate, especially at low scale, at small scales. And therefore, what, the first question is, uh, why did you use uh, such obsolete, let's say, uh, simulations um, and um, whether this can affect your predictions on, on, the, on the lower scales uh, that you have analyzed? Uh, my second question is, uh, I have three questions. Um, in using the whole analysis and with the register space distortion, which again, you do an excellent work of comparing with predictions. Um, however, you, if I understood well, you use halo catalogs from your simulations. 
uh, it is also well known that depending on the halo algorithm, a halo finding algorithm, you get quite significant differences. Therefore, how sensitive is your predictions on the different halo algorithms? For example, we know that the friends of friends algorithm gives completely different results than the, uh, the over density algorithm that's based on uh, spherical over densities and so on and so forth. So how sensitive it is to that. And the last question I want to ask is something which is very important in when using the simulations is that you can you can actually estimate the cosmic variance which you will have it definitely in your observations because you cannot you cannot uh, you can you may produce a one gigaparsec or two gigaparsec uh, universe in your simulation but you cannot as easily do that with, with data therefore you will have in your data you will have the effects of cosmic variance um, in your analytical predictions, that, that's the question. In the analytical predictions, how can you actually estimate the, the, the expected cosmic variance that you will have in your predictions? That is, uh, you may predict, of course, and the comparison with, your, uh, with the simulations, I suppose, are with very large simulations. Therefore, you have, uh, you, have, uh, you have tackled the cosmic variance by that, uh, by using such big simulations. In the real world, you will have cosmic variance. How can your, uh, your predictions um, take into account the scatter that you may have uh, in the data that may bring you outside from your main uh, prediction, but it could still be within the expectations of the model. But how will you know that? Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the kind words first. And these are all of these three, they're great questions. Uh, of course, uh, put together by an expert in the field of cosmology. So let me start one, uh, answering them one by one. And if I forget uh, any of them, just you can follow up. So first of all, about uh, uh, the comparison, about the use of a PM code, great question, uh, as you correctly started. So uh, the quick answer is that I stood on the shoulders of giants, meaning that um, this particular scheme we used has also in uh, other uh, works that uh, we, we were based upon in the literature, but also follow-up ones, uh, was uh, more extensively compared uh, against full uh, simulations of, of uh, you know, state of the art that went way beyond this simple uh, PM prediction. So given that we knew that uh, 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 this particular scheme did not seem uh, to, make, to lose accuracy with regards to this particular observable, the fractional deviation, when one would go from a, a, a newer code to a PM uh, method, uh, we, we uh, ran our own PM code uh, uh, simulations to make this comparison because they are much, as, as you may be able to imagine, because they are much cheaper and they were much easier uh, for us to run and run multiple of those to also account for the effects of cosmic variance, by the way, as, you, as I'm, I'm going to get to in the third question, as, as you can see here, by the way, the error bars are the cosmic variance. But yeah, absolutely, uh, fully, if one wants to be precise, uh, one is to use a, a, a more modern simulations. And uh, uh, this has been done. And actually, even, even, even very recently, meaning even... 10 days ago, and I haven't even uh, uh, fully gotten through this paper, uh, the, uh, the COLA method was even uh, uh, tested against uh, HOD mocks that came out of a, of, of, a full, uh, uh, of a full simulation code of next generation and found to also work well, well even there. So this is something that even I didn't expect. And it is great to see uh, the, this level of consistency. But of course, I totally agree that uh, we need uh, to always be careful about this. Uh, meaning that when we make a comparison, we need to take uh, to always keep in mind that uh, such a simple uh, uh, predictive scheme might lead us to, to the loss of some accuracy or some potential biases. And also, by the way, uh, uh, there's also the effect of variance that becomes uh, a part that becomes significant uh, when one looks in smaller scales, which is something that maybe you had in mind, which also needs to be incorporated and has started to be incorporated into the, the uh, absolute latest generation of modified gravity simulations, which is not taken into account here, but starts to become significant at around k of equals one, which is uh, uh, shorter, uh, which is uh, uh, larger scales than we would wish for and we would have to account for. Now, uh, let me get to your other question, which was it was about uh, the 
uh, about the halo finding process, great, which I kind of touched upon. So yes, great, as, as, as you very correctly, um, as you very correctly uh, put, uh, laid out, uh, we used, uh, and thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to clarify this because I, I kept using the term halo and galaxy interchangeably, but I actually used halos, which we know that they're biased tracers as well, but uh, I do not use galaxy, galaxy mocks here. So yes, indeed, there is, the, there is a, a, a dependence in, in the particular properties of the halo finding algorithm that they, one would use to give a prediction for the halo, for the halo catalogs. And uh, in, indeed, this, uh, one might get an observed uh, difference based on the particular halo finding process. Uh, likely, it seems that uh, with regards to the particular analytical model I've, I, I've used, one can uh, uh, account, one can keep uh, uh, the particular assumptions the Halo Finder made in mind in order to adjust for them. For example, as I'm sure you know, uh, many different Halo Finding codes uh, use different assumptions about uh, the, the critical mass uh, that, uh, that defines a Halo, for example, and uh, of 200 of the critical density or 400, and you use also different definitions about how to uh, define this mass. Uh, so the, the analytical model in particular, uh, through the, this excursion set picture I showed, Likely can, can, can kind of be flexible enough to account for this through the through redefinition of the critical uh, over density. But it is true that at the end of the day, you might get some difference with regards to the halo finder. Uh, but uh, this is also an issue for observations. Uh, the analytical model can follow the halo finder, but uh, it is a deeper question that the halo, that uh, the halo, the galaxy mocks that will be produced out of them will also need to take this into account. And uh, thirdly, the cosmic variance, yes, indeed, it is there. And actually, I'm glad that no one explicitly challenged me. You can see that in the quadrupole, uh, how, how significant it is, the combination of a limited simulation volume and uh, with uh, a limited number of samples with a finite number of realizations gives you this uh, cosmic variance here. Uh, so th this is a great question. I would say, honestly, even analytically, even if one doesn't want to run multiple simulations, the fastest way I can think of to account for cosmic variance is to run a, two, a Lagrangian perturbation theory uh, simulation, which is not a full simulation, where one can essentially uh, 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 um, get the phases of the Fourier modes of the density field through a random generator. And these, like, these Lagrangian perturbation theory codes are very fast, meaning even though it's a code, it runs like this in two minutes. So uh, this is literally, the, in practice, the fastest way I can think of to get the effects of cosmic variance if you don't want to run a, a thousand simulations. There might be analytical... No. Yes. Sorry, I have to intervene here because we're yes, running out of over time. time. Uh, Oops, we are sorry, already yes. five minutes over, so I think it's hard to have any other questions. Uh, I would encourage everyone to just uh, use Slack, which is, uh, I'm sure, yes, young people it. like uh, uh, Yorgos are very familiar with, and uh, continue the discussion there. I don't know if Jelena want to say something before we break completely and move to the other sessions that should have started five minutes ago. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Nothing else, Yorgo. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για μια εξωτική για έναν ιστορικό απλό ομιλία, αλλά έτσι μπαίνει κανεί στο στο universe. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ πολύ. Είμαι πανεσπιχής που πήρε στο πρώτο βραβείο και είμαι και ιδιαίτερα συγκινημένη πρέπει να πω σήμερα και ευχαριστώ όλους για αυτή την πολύ ωραία εκδήλωση. Εγώ ευχαριστώ. Πραγματικά η ευχαρίστηση και η τιμή είναι δική μου. Ε, μου δίνει μεγάλη χαρά αυτό και ελπίζω να μπορέσω να σας δω από κοντά ε, κάποια στιγμή στο μέλλον. Νομίζω ναι. Νομίζω ναι. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστώ And, πολύ. Thank... πολύ ε, κύριε ε, Βασίλη ε, και όλους ε, στην Ελλασέτ. Και καλό σας, καλή σας, ε, ε, καλή δουλειά ε, να, στη συνέχεια. Ευχαριστούμε. Ευχαριστώ I, I will now join Slack ε, mm. in case there are questions.